everybody, welcome to another Bill Sky, the assembly guy. And what we're going to do in this video is we're going to set up Windows Subsystem for Linux on a Windows 11 computer. Now Windows 10 isn't much different, I don't even know if there is a difference, but we're going to do it on Windows 11 because it's the most current and actually become very, very stable operating system. Now this is a completely optional video. If you're using VirtualBox, if you're using VMware, if you have your own Linux computer, you don't need to do this. But if you're on Windows and you want to uh, get Linux going, but you don't want to install all that stuff, but you just want to do what comes with Windows, this is your, this is your video. I'm going to show you how to do all that. So let's get started. Okay, so what we have here is we have our Windows 11. Now this is on a virtual, virtualized Windows 11. It shouldn't make any difference than if you've got one on your, installed on your computer. And we're going to set up Windows uh, Subsystem for Linux. Now Windows Subsystem, <laughs> Windows Subsystem for Linux is a feature that was added in Windows 10. Uh, since the new chief executive officer of Microsoft took over, he's a big Linux guy. He wanted developers to be able to develop on Linux or actually used Linux development tools on Windows to develop applications because not everybody is a Windows developer or likes Windows development tools. So there's a ton of stuff on Linux to do that. It makes it really, really easy. It's really kind of like a developer's favorite operating system. And you can find that all over the internet. So what we're going to do is we're going to install that. Now, the first thing you need to do is you need to turn it on. Well, actually, right before that, you need to set up your BIOS. So take a look at the video on setting up your computer. Uh, your computer's BIOS UEFI firmware to allow virtualization. I'll put a link to that in the video notes. Okay, so down here on search, I'm going to type in turn on, and you're going to see, um, well, it's not actually coming up right away, so let's say turn on, let's get rid of game mode, turn Windows, oh, there it is, turn Windows features on or off, so I go ahead and click on that. And I always like to resize it so I can see everything. And what you need to do is you need to turn on the Windows or the Virtual Machine Platform and you need to turn on Windows Subsystem for Linux. So turn both of those on. You don't need to turn on Hyper-V or anything like that. Just go ahead and turn those two on and click OK. Now when you click OK, it's going to enable some files. I don't know if it's copying them from the Internet. I don't know if it's just unhiding them or whatever. But go ahead and set those up and then restart your computer. And as soon as the computer is back up and running, uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, continue. All right, so it finished installing, and now what I'm doing is I'm rebooting the computer. You're gonna see absolutely nothing different. There's nothing different. It just went ahead and installed or set up or initialized or whatever it does, the files necessary to run Windows Subsystem for Linux on Windows. So the next thing we need to do is we need to go to the Windows Store, the Microsoft Store, and we need to actually download a Linux. Now there's a few Linuxes or Linux I or whatever the plural is for Linux, but there's a few Linuxes out there. My favorite is Ubuntu, and I believe that is the favorite of most, uh, most people on Linux. So U-B-U-N-T-U. -U. Now you can install this Ubuntu that just says Ubuntu, or you can install the Ubuntu 2204 or the 20 or the 18. Each one of them is a different version. I don't know what the difference is between 2204 and Ubuntu. Um, I just like to click on the most recent one. So go ahead and install that little puppy. And that's going to download some stuff. And uh, now you don't want to start it right away. So we have to do a couple things after that's done downloading and we'll go ahead and let that download. Now while that's downloading, um, I'm going to get something else started which you have to do after you do the download. I'm going to come down here and search and type power, just power, PowerShell. And over here on PowerShell, you can see it right there. I'm going to click on that. Now I've never done this not as an administrator, so I'm going to go ahead and just close that and I'm going to do it again. I'm going to, there it is up on top this time, and I'm going to click on Run as Administrator. Now, when I click on Run as Administrator, it gives you this user account control window. Just go ahead and click on Yes, and there it is. Okay, now it downloaded Ubuntu 22.4. Do not click Open yet, because what we need to do is there's two different versions of Windows Subsystem for Linux. There's version 1 and version 2. We want to get version 2 set up. So when you do that from the PowerShell command line on Windows. So I'm going to go ahead and close the store. And I'm going to type WSL dash dash update. I'm going to say yes, I want to install it. And this is going to install the newest version of WSL. Now, once WSL version 2.2 is installed, we have to shut down 
the subsystem for Linux engine, and then we have to set the default version so whenever we create a Linux or we use a Linux, it uses version 2.0. And there it goes, very, very nice, it installed it okay. Now I'm gonna say WSL shutdown. All right, now I'm gonna say WSL dash dash set default version space two. And that means that any uh, Linux operating system or any one that I set up or install will go to version two. Now you might have to change them if you already have some installed. Uh, we're not gonna go through that in this video, but you can find it on the internet pretty, pretty easily. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the PowerShell and I'm gonna go down here to search. And I'm gonna just look for Ubuntu. There it is right there. I'm gonna click on it. And um, up, what does it say here? Ensure virtualization is enabled in the BIOS. Um, oh, we got a little bit of a hiccup here, so let's go ahead and press enter, and let's go ahead and fix that. I maybe I didn't set up the virtualization for this VM system, so I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. Okay, so like an idiot, I didn't actually set up the virtualization enablement of my VM guest operating system, and you'll see something like that if you don't set up your um, if you don't set up the virtualization on your computer. It won't be that exact same error, but it'll be something very, very close. So I went ahead and enabled that on Windows, or actually actually on my virtualization program. I'm actually using VMware here, so that makes it really easy. I'm rebooting, and let's go ahead and try that Ubuntu out once again. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and log in. Let's go on search, Ubuntu. And now when it starts, it's it's installing. It's setting up some uh, files. It's setting up some security. It's setting up, uh, getting ready to set up your user ID. And what it's going to do is it's going to ask you to go ahead and type in a user ID and password. Now, in the Windows subsystem for Linux, unless you're using it as a server, I'm not concerned about security. I don't care, right? It's running underneath Windows. There's a Windows firewall. So I normally don't ever do anything really super secure on it so I don't have to worry about security. So my user ID is normally Linux user and my password is normally the word password. Just makes it really easy. And this might take a few minutes. So let's go ahead and let it continue. Now, when it's done setting up, it asks you for your uh, Unix username. It's Linux, but Unix Linux actually comes from Unix. So I'm gonna just type Linux user and I'm gonna have to type in the password twice and just the word password. You can type anything you want. If you wanna be very secure, uh, that would be great. All right, so that creates our Linux. Now we have to install some of the development tools. So once it finishes the installation, it looks like it's working out really well here. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna install some of the development tools. And I can put a list of these in the, in the video notes and there we go, so now we're on Linux. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type sudo apt update. Now what sudo means is super user do, super user do something. apt is the application uh, installation and maintenance program, and update means I wanna update all the libraries. Now the first time I use it, it asks me for my password, and it goes ahead and it downloads all of the Ubuntu uh, library sources, source files to tell it where to go to find applications. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and update it. Pseudo APT upgrade. Now this will upgrade all of the features that I have, uh, that I've downloaded and installed. Uh, remember the Ubuntu that we installed came from the Microsoft Store. It may not have though the most recent uh, updates. So you have to update the, the uh, source repository files that are on the Ubuntu. Then you have to upgrade it to the most recent. And I really recommend you do that. Now you have to do the update to get the uh, development tools installed. The upgrade is optional, but you really should for security reasons. So we'll go ahead and let that finish. Okay, once the installation is done, we've just updated the operating system. We don't have to reboot or anything like that, so, but we can start installing our development tools. So sudo apt install, dash y means just don't ask me if I want to do it or not. Just say yes, I want to do it. And we want to do build essential first. And it just goes. It just goes ahead and installs everything it needs. Now, Build Essential are the essential development tools like the C compiler, a linker, things like that. 
and we'll go ahead and let that finish. Okay, once that installation is done, we've installed the general, the, the basic tools. I'm going to type GCC. GCC is the C compiler. There we go. I'm going to try G++. G++ was also installed. That's our C++ compiler. LD is our linker. Looks great. Now our assembler is going to be called NASM. NASM can't be found, so I'm going to install it. And this will install our assembler. Uh, now there's a couple other things you can install. Um, I actually love Valgrind because it, it does memory analysis, application analysis. Oh, I already did NASM. So let's try Valgrind. Uh, now you're not going to really use Valgrind too much with assembler language, but I always like to have it. Uh, the next thing we're going to install is the graphical debugger. So DDD. I think that's data display debugger. I'm not sure. So we'll go ahead and install that debugger. Uh, then we're going to install a really nice editor. We're going to install Genie. This is a great programmer's editor. In fact, you can even build your application from the Genie as long as you have a make file, which we're going to do in this example. We're going to set up a, a make file. Well, maybe we won't set up a make file in this because this is mainly just getting WSL uh, installed. We'll do that in another video. So we'll get Genie all installed. All right, once Genie is installed, let's put, let's also install the Genie plugins. Those are for language parsing and things like that in the Genie editor, very, very useful. Let's go ahead and let that continue. Now, something about Genie, Genie is a graphical user interface program, but how do you do that on Linux? Well, the really cool thing about Windows Subsystem for Linux version two it lets you use graphical programs. We'll see that in just a moment. Okay, so let's go ahead and now do another very useful tool, G-Hex. That is a graphical hexadecimal editor. It's a GNOME hexadecimal editor. We're gonna do G-Edit, which is kind of like the default editor. And then we're also gonna install a program called Nautilus, which allows you to do graphical file system browsing and stuff on Linux. It's really cool. You'll see that in just a moment. And we're going to do Nautilus. Oh, and there's one more I think uh, I need to install. I also need to install an Xterm. Xterm is a terminal program that is used by the DDD uh, debugger to do debugs. So let's go ahead and do that. As soon as this, this install is done, uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Also, we are going to want to install Vim. So I'll have a list of all these tools out there. All right, so this is almost done. Uh, let's go ahead and do Xterm. Sometimes it hesitates, it's doing something. There we go, just give it a second. Okay, so let's do Xterm. And then we will do Vim and that should be it. Now Vim is a, is a command line editor. Oh, it's already installed. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a directory called documents. Um, I'm gonna make a directory called downloads too. So the ls commands means list the file system and you can see our documents and downloads folder. That's where we're gonna store stuff. Now what I'm gonna to do to get out of Linux here, I'm just gonna type exit. I'm gonna go back into the PowerShell. There's PowerShell run as administrator. And I'm going to execute a WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux command, just to make sure that our Linux is at version 2 of WSL. And that command is actually pretty easy. It's WSL-L-V. Uh, there we go. I had to press Enter for some reason. So WSL-L-V. And you can see that our Ubuntu 22.04 has been stopped but it is at version two, so we're fine. We're working out just great here. So let's go back to the start. Oh, there's Ubuntu right there. I'm gonna go ahead and start it up. Now I'm gonna right click on the little icon for Ubuntu down here, and I'm gonna tell it to pin to taskbar so I don't have to start it up every single time. And there we go. So I mentioned that 
well, WSL2 allows you to do graphic applications. And it does. I'm going to start the Genie program. Now, the way I can start the Genie program is I type Genie. Now, if I just type Genie, the program will come up, but my terminal will be locked. I won't be able to do anything behind Genie. So I'm going to say Genie ampersand. And there's Genie. And this editor is not on Windows. It's on Linux, which is pretty cool. So I can go back and forth. So I'm going to create a new file. And I'm going to say this is a test file. And I'm going to save it. And notice it's not saving it on Windows. It's saving it on my Linux virtual machine. So I'm going to go to Documents. I'm just going to call it test.txt. Save it. I'm going to close Genie. Now we get all of the warnings and all the errors and stuff on the terminal there. I just press Enter to get rid of that. And I'm going to do an ls. I'm going to change directory to documents. And there's my test.txt file. So I'm going to say vim test.txt. And there's a vim editor command line. That's a terminal editor. And there you go. So you are all set to set up assembler programs. If you want to just take a look at the version of your assembler, NASM dash dash version. There it is, version 2.15. So we're all set to start writing a, 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 a Linux assembly language program, both 32-bit and 64-bit. Now, there's one last thing that I will put in the notes for the video, and that's how to install the ARM emulator for uh, Linux. And so that's, a, that's about three or four additional commands. Um, but we're, we're going to take a look at that when we actually start looking at ARM assembly language programming. So you're all set, Windows 11, Windows 10, Windows Subsystem for Linux with Ubuntu. See you at the next video.